By now, you've probably heard my magic wand story. It's a brand that's been part of my personal journey for more than 20 years. But no matter how many times I sing magic wands praises, I'll never be able to fully capture the story of this incredible brand. Well, now journalist and author Kate Sloan just completed a limited audio series documenting the history and impact that Magic Wand has created over the last 56 years. It's called Making Magic. And the series chronicles Magic Wand's incredible brand story through interviews with nearly 40 experts, performers, business owners, educators, and fans. So I got a sneak preview of the series. And what I loved is that Kate weaves together snippets from all their interviews into this amazing story arc. She covers Magic Wand's journey from a appliance store massager to its legendary influence on culture and sexual independence. And it's all just fascinating. The first episodes of Making Magic are available now at makingmagicseries.com or on all popular podcast platforms. Just search for Making Magic or visit makingmagicseries.com today. In Chinese medicine, it's about heart and reproductive organs. Like that's the basic thing. There's an extra vessel in Chinese medicine that connects our heart to our reproductive organs. And it's sort of like the liver energy in Chinese medicine opens to the eyes. So visually looking at your partner, kissing, the heart opens to the tongue. So really making out the tongue. Making out, again, like you used to. Yeah, it goes into the uterus. It's connected. It's like this idea. So it's really about moving energy, right? So Taoist practices are about connecting heart and uterus and connecting energy. So we're circulating our energies and we're circulating our energies with our partner. Thanks for listening to Sex with Emily. On today's show, I'm joined by certified sex coach, clinic director of natural healing and acupuncture, and author of the new book, Conceiving with Love, Denise Wiesner, and all things you should and shouldn't do while trying to have a baby. Topics include, sex is supposed to be hot, but why does baby making tend to get so technical? Well, we give you tips to keep it sexy. How using Chinese medicine like herbs, acupuncture, and diet can help when trying to conceive. Breast massages and aromatherapy. I mean, it already sounds good, but why you should try it to get aroused. And natural and holistic hacks that heighten your senses and stimulate sex. All this and more. Thanks for listening. Look into his eyes. They're the eyes of a man obsessed by sex. Eyes that mock our sacred institutions. Bedroom eyes, they call them in a bygone day. Hey, Emily. You got a boyfriend? Because my man E here, he just got his heart broken. He thinks you're kind of cute. A girl's got to have her standards. Oh, my. Do women know about shrinkage? Isn't it common knowledge? What do you mean? Like laundry? It shrinks? Can we not talk about sex so much? Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. I feel so good. Being bad feels pretty good. You know, Emily's not the kind of girl you just play with. You're listening to Sex with Emily. We're talking about sex, relationships, and everything in between. For more information, check out sexwithemily.com. Check out our podcast. We release three a week. So wherever you listen to podcasts, check them out. And you can find us on all social media across the board. It's at Sex with Emily. You can also find me Monday through Friday on Sirius XM Radio. It's on Stars Channel 109 from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific for even more awesome sex talk. You can also get a free trial at sexwithemily.com slash SXM. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview with Denise Wiesner. And remember, even if you're not trying to conceive, there's a lot of great tips in here for you. All right, I'm very excited to welcome my guest today, Denise Wiesner. She's a traditional Chinese medicine specialist, certified sex coach. She's a clinical director of natural healing and acupuncture and author of the new book, Conceiving with Love. She has over 25 years of practice, including yoga, acupuncture, and tantra. Here's the thing. She's helped thousands of people reconnect and ultimately conceive, like get pregnant and have the baby. Like that has worked. She's thousands of couples. That's amazing. Her methods have been proven for couples using both Western medicine and those trying to conceive naturally. And when she's not working or teaching or writing, she plays guitar. She practices yoga. She danced. I feel like she's a dancer. She walked in. I'm like, we should be twirl around. I've been spending time with Noah and Ethan, her two sons. So welcome to the show. Congratulations on your book. And I want to say one more thing before I let you talk. It's not like that, though. You can actually talk. But I'm not like a dictator. But what I loved about your book is even if you're just want to tell you now that even if you're like, well, I'm not ready to conceive or I don't want to have kids. I thought that your book was so such practical information for women and for couples just trying to connect and understand their sex lives. And it was like a lot of the tips that that I give, but with like different spins on it and just really well written and well done. So I just think 
I don't know, if you couple sex, you want to improve your sex life, you want to get through trauma, you want to understand East meets West sexuality practices, it's well done. Hello, Denise. Hi, thank you so much. Hi, I'm so excited to have you here and thank you for interviewing me for the book. Mm-hmm. That's when we met. We had like a, a friendship affair on, on Skype and then we decided we were going to be friends, but she lives on the other side of the highway, but we're going to figure it out. Yes, we are. And um, welcome. So let's talk about like, like sex around pregnancy in general. Can we just start there? I get so many questions from people. They're like, the second you does, decide to get pregnant, sex is not fun anymore because it's like clock is ticking. Why does it become so unsexy when we're trying to conceive? What happens? I think there's a lot of pressure for women, right? Because they have this like little window where they're ovulating. And and I think also in today's society, people are so busy, right? Everyone's like so stressed out and they're working a lot. And sometimes the timing is like, you know, you just come home from work and you're tired and, and this is the one window you have. And then the husband comes home and he's tired and you're like, oh my gosh, we have to do this thing now. And people just don't, It's it becomes pressure and stressful. It is stressful. So what do you tell people to do about that to kind of, I know there's a whole process but what would you tell them I kind of think it's important to have regular intimacy right I mean it sort of starts in the morning it's not just thinking of like okay come home put it on I think we have to sort of have regular sex all the time but in conceiving with love I talk a lot about like sort of setting the stage and doing things different and there's this whole foreplay section let's talk about your foreplay section (laughs) it's my favorite as long as we're starting the sex show now let's start with foreplay it's kind of like I have so many things to do, but I, I have this feng shui where I talk about like setting the room, you know, like where it makes it more intimate. Sometimes like, you know, there's like clutter, like my room. Um, I love that. I folded back the page here on that. You did? The bedroom. Yeah, because I think it's so great. Let's talk about it. Like people don't think about it. It matters, your room. Right. You're, you're, you know, it's like if you have electronics in the bedroom, how many couples come home at night and they're like, oh my God, I got to send one more email. Oh my God, what did they say on the computer? And their electronics like follow them into the bedroom. Right. And so it's, you know, sort of the rule of like no electronics in the bedroom and they also find that electronics don't do well with sperm like you know High, what? T- right that's right? huge yeah get the, if there's another reason yeah get the phone and just like you just give good tips for like the colors of the room and like how to make it that's what i was saying you really get into depth on a lot of the things that you're like concepts that i've talked about for anybody like even myself i'm single like making my bedroom really sexy right now so it's like make the colors that you should have and taking the you know electronics out of the room the, i think your bedroom should be for sleeping and for sex. So, like, tell me about your typical, like, woman who comes to you and what happens. Like, is is there a typical woman who comes to you and says, I'm ready to conceive, help me, or I've been trying. Yeah. What do I do? I have a lot of uh, couples that come to me and women that come to me. And sometimes it looks like I've had three failed IVFs and I don't know what to do. And, and, and I'm, you know, I'm desperate kind of. And I really help me conceive. I heard Chinese medicine helps. And at that point, they've been doing so much medication and so much timed intercourse and ejaculation in a cup that those couples are really like the sometimes that they bring the husband in he kind of we talk about sex and the husband is like you know they all sort of freeze and nobody wants to talk because they're not having any sex because they've been doing all these there is just sex is equated with failed IVFs really and failed fertility so that's one and then I also have people that are trying naturally that just really want to get help and they don't know what to do and they don't know what to eat and they don't know like just the first thing about being healthy to conceive so those are kind of my two groups so let's talk about Chinese medicine how that plays a role as well and everything that you do it's acupuncture and also you give them herbs yeah 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 I just kind of (laughs) Chinese medicine looks at the whole body so I would evaluate them and look at what's going on with their emotional life what's going on with their digestion their sleep their um all their habits you know how, how what's their cervical fluid like you know sometimes women don't don't even know that they're supposed to have this certain special cervical fluid during the ovulation window and they 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 never check themselves and just kind of like the whole body and then I deal with what's out of balance and I might do acupuncture in fact I mostly do acupuncture Chinese herbs nutrition talk about like foods that might be you know let's say I have a patient who it runs really hot like really super super hot all the time I might cool them down or or a woman who's like cold all the time which is more typical right. um, freezing and they're eating like ice cold blended and they're eating salads and raw food I might change their diet so that they we say have a warm uterus you know yeah. so they have more blood flow so it just depends on what's going on do you, you know? check them each time they come in like do you check their blood pressure you check what do you do when they come in their tongue yeah we, we look at <laughs> I look at their tongue and check their pulse and kind of look at their whole body I mean I just had a woman come to me and she she's was having really bad menstrual pain and she had these dark 
darkest circles under her eyes. And that's a sign of, we say, kidney deficiency in Chinese medicine, which is sort of like kidneys, are, water energy is about reproduction. So it's like, ooh, that energy's not doing well. You know, what's going on? And right. turns out she wasn't sleeping a lot. But, you know, that's, we look at signs and symptoms of the whole body. How do you figure all of that out? Are you, are you doing blood work and you're doing... Everything. Yeah, yeah, a lot of okay. times, you know, it, it, things that don't get diagnosed, like, for example, a woman could be really cold and tired and, her, you know, she's just not really getting a period. I would maybe do a blood test and look at her hormones or a thyroid could be, a you know, a culprit. Most of the time when people come to me, they've had those tests done already. But if they don't, I would like to see blood tests. It's really the marriage of Western and Eastern, right, right together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how did you get into this? Cause I know you had your own fertility journey, if yeah. you want to talk about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I had one child and I found out when I was pregnant with my first one that I was a carrier of Tay-Sachs, which is a genetic disorder and the yeah. baby, it's fatal. And I found out actually my husband was a, a carrier okay. and I was like, oh, I'm not a carrier. Everything's going to be fine. And then in the, in the beginning of my pregnancy, I found out I was a carrier. Oh. So we, we had to go through the testing of the baby and it turned out my first was okay. So that was this whole you know, sort of wow. rude awakening. Yeah. And then I had a couple miscarriages and had um, the baby, he was okay, but I had miscarriages and I thought I was really healthy and I didn't understand and no one checked my thyroid and I went to like three different acupuncturists and a naturopath and nobody was really marrying the Western and Eastern, right? They kept wanting to uh, deal with my lungs (laughs) and my breathing. And so I, I ended up really trying to figure out what was going on for me. And then I was trying to conceive my second and I was like, same thing. I was this mad woman kind of trying to get my husband to like, I'm ovulating honey as the cervical muca was coming out in the toilet. And I was like yelling for him like, hey, hey, it's time. Like, completely unsexy. Right. And sort of just thought there was a huge need to talk about sexuality, intimacy, fertility, and and marry the, all of them together. So most people aren't like if a traditional... What's going on? People don't blend the Eastern. Their typical journeys are they're going to go to their Western doctor. They're going to say, I've been trying to conceive. And then they, maybe they'll, they'll offer IVF or they'll say, I mean, what? I just feel like it's so limiting right now. It usually is. You go to your doctor and depending on your blood test and your age, there's a little bit of a fear factor, right? Like, oh, no, you should start you know, your your levels don't look great. Oh, no, your ovarian reserve is low. A lot of women in their 40s will tell me based on blood tests. And women get into a huge panic, which we know is really not good for fertility, right? Because right? it takes all the blood away from the reproductive organs and sends it into like the fight, flight, freeze mode, right? right? Oh, no, oh, no, fear. Oh, my, oh, my right. gosh. So Western doctors like OBGYNs offer up like Clomid usually. And, right. and a lot of my patients will be starting Clomid and, and and hoping that they get pregnant with an insemination. That's Or they might do some test, more testing, like to make sure the tubes are open and the, the uterus looks, the an- anatomy of the uterus looks okay. So, you know, they'll be testing. And then, you know, sometimes they'll come to me in that point. Um, it, it's good to have some tests. I mean, right. it's good to see. But do you think they, so we still, there is still a place for that, right? Or will you, would you recommend they do all that, the Clomed? Or would you say try acupuncture first and try your, you know? It kind of depends on the age, right? Okay. You yeah. know, so if a woman's like 30, 30 years old and, you know, like, yeah, it's nice to see, but, you know, you can try for a year with, you know, yeah. and try natural stuff for a year without having to go to the doctor. And that's what the doctors say. So I think it's good to just try what depend on your age. If you're 40, Maybe it's better to sort of get a little bit checked out, make sure that we're not, you know, the sperm is okay, right? Like right. Well, also, how come we don't check the sperm as much as we check women's? Or maybe they, that's happening more now, but I feel like I have to tell my friends, like, has he gotten his, has he checked yet? When they're like, <laughs> we beat ourselves up, something's wrong with me, and then sure enough. Gosh, I'm seeing more and more male fertility right now, infertility. Let's People, talk, why? What do you think I, that's about? I think maybe environment, I'm not really sure, but a lot of know. men undiagnosed, like they have low, very low, low sperm counts, and nobody knows why. And I, I treat a lot Nobody of those Nobody knows men. why. And you can Mm-mm. treat them as well. So you're treating men and women to get safer, to get... Yes, both men and women. Oh, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. How about with women? Are you noticing women are having lower fertility now too? I think women wait a little bit longer. So there's lower fertility as we age and there's a lot of panic around it. So, um, you know, if I think about like my grandmother, I think she in her 40s had, you know, like oopsie baby. You yeah, know, my so grandma and my and her brother were like, 12 years apart, right? I think those, at at that time, women were having babies in their 40s, but nowadays, like, you know, Wilmington's 40 and she has a a huge panic that she won't conceive. So maybe it's age and working and And environment. And mental and emotional and all that stuff. Yeah, all that Um, stuff. So what are some steps so that you would say, like, better chances that people can take to get pregnant? Are there just some basics if people are like, like, what shouldn't we do? 
what should we do? What are like, what's your like 101? Like, I think, okay, we shouldn't smoke. Right. No, smoke. Put away. How about vape? Uh, vaping, no, it's not good. Vaping's right. not good. And okay, even cannabis, like, Cannabis slows down sperm and decreases men's testosterone. I've a heard bit. this too. Yeah, so that's a big thing here in California, right? Yeah, it's, illegal. it's everywhere. Yeah, so um, that's not good for fertility. So it's for men and for women. For men and for, we don't know. What so about much women. for women? What about getting us in the mood for sex? I know. Um, I think <laughs> there, it's it's good to. I, I'm not sure. We don't know about. But if it's not good for sperm, it can't be good for eggs because they kind true. of are made. That's true. So don't get high. Don't smoke cigarettes. Yeah, so t- taking all the fun okay, out of that's it. That's right? fine. Yeah, it's fine. You can do that. You can do that for. Well, right. What else? Uh, I have stress. I think it's a huge thing, right? The more we are are fearful and panicked, I th- the blood goes away from our reproductive organs and goes to you know to Go do ahead, the fight, fight, flight, flight, freeze, right? right so. Still- you know, stress is like a big one. Getting women to relax, to really, you know, do yoga, meditate, um, eat well, right? You know, but but I, I feel like the fear factor is huge because women get really panicky and then they're they're anxious and then it's like, honey, let's do it now. And and I well, think that whole thing, ha- right? And then, and then it's like just not not sexy. And that's why I'm always like saying, like, make it sexy throughout. Like, do things that you know. Do things that you, this is a great time to do a lot of the tips if you've been listening to the show that I tell you to do. Get some toys, play some games, go on vacation, even for a night, getting out of the same bedroom, like doing something different and don't make it all about your clock ticking or your, your ovulating. And if you know you're ovulating, then plan something fun for that night. Not just like alarms going off, get home from work. Like, yeah, even though we're all busy, I, I know. I totally agree. But you know what happens sometimes for men Tell that me. I'm seeing is that men under pressure don't always perform. And that's what I see in my clinic, that there's like, you know, it's this time and men have to like do it this one time because they're not having regular sex, that they all of a sudden it's pressure on them and they can't get an erection. I've heard that too. So what do you tell them? I mean, really, it's really just about sleeping well, meditation <laughs> and breathing. Don't you feel like that's just... Yeah, it would solve, solve our but, problems. Like literally it would, it would, and it does. I mean, truly, we are all so freaking stressed out. Um, I feel like, okay, so we talked about the diet, right? Is there, is there a diet though that you recommend? Is it, or is it different for everybody? I think it's best to, it's different for everybody, but okay. there are some basic things like, you know, stay away from refined foods. Don't drink a lot of caffeine um, or don't try to really limit caffeine. Don't have a lot of sugar. Don't have any sugar. No sugar. Low, no sugar. And there's a whole thing. No milk of, duds. No milk. No, no she milk was looking duds. at my milk duds here. I love milk <laughs> duds. Okay. But I'm not trying to get pregnant. Not, not fertile friendly. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and eat foods as grown. Eat whole foods as grown. Um, probably, you know, I have vegetarian patients and, you know, I, I there's a lot of reasons people are vegan and I wouldn't say that's bad, but it's good to get enough protein. And, yeah, so meats are okay. Yeah, yeah. Like grass-fed. Yeah, grass-fed. And, and eating eating foods as grown and, and limiting refined, maybe for a lot of people, dairies are, you know, huge inflammatory food, food especially women with PCOS. Like, really, dairy's not good. okay. So eliminating dairy and sugars and, you know, and sometimes weed is very inflammatory. So uh, so get all the tests, figure out what you're... Yeah. I mean, I, I generally would say like wheat, dairy, caffeine, alcohol, alcohol, not good. Um, maybe occasionally, you know, I, I like to use the, the middle way. I hate to be like, don't ever do this because right. then everybody's like hugely stressed. But just in general, 80% to 90% of your diet should be like really good, healthy fertile foods you know put goji berries in a trail mix those are good for women I love goji berries i, I always so, forget to get them yeah they're really good i love a goji berry yeah. they're right okay that's note yeah. to self not trying to get pregnant again but goji berries are good for everything they keep coming up i feel yeah. like they do okay so okay i know you work with chinese medicine and taoist practices as well as western so like what are the differences that you how would we even explain those practices to people how do you explain them um, what is the difference uh, so, so Tantra is based on the sort of Hindu tradition, um, and and t- there are God, there's some Tantra is like oh so we could, it's so much For, I know this Tantra is like a big a big thing you know there's Neo Tantra but really it's really about opening up our connection and in Chinese medicine it's about heart and reproductive organs like that's the basic thing there's an extra vessel in Chinese medicine that connects our heart to our reproductive organs and it's sort of like the, the liver energy in Chinese medicine opens to the eyes so visually looking at your partner, right? Kissing, the heart opens to the tongue. So really making out the tongue. Making out, again, like you used to. Yeah, it goes into the uterus. It's connected. It's like this idea. So the it's really about moving energy, right? So Taoist practices are about connecting 
you know, heart and uterus and connecting energies. So we're circulating our energies and we're circulating our energies with our partner. So, you know, it's it's just about being... Do you teach this practice though? I know you talk about it in the book too. Like I feel like I tried it on the show. I've talked about it a bit and I've practiced it a little bit, but I do, I have felt that energy. Have you had sex, that was sex with the connection and the energy yeah. and the flow and men with the ejaculation without orgasm? And I've done the ejaculation without orgasm, but of course I'm, you know, that was way back before I was trying to get pregnant. Right. And, and so that's a whole debatable thing. But when we're talking about fer- fertility, yeah. it's the opposite. It is they, the opposite. They actually, it's bringing the energy from like up top, you know, and bringing it through yep. the channels and bringing it out through ejaculating right. during the fertile window. Right, right, right. Right, if a man's really exhausted when he's ejaculating and he's ejaculating too much, right? Men sometimes, you know, ejaculate too much and they're tired afterwards and I would have them curtail around, you know, but make sure that they're on the fertile window that they Do ejaculate. you tell the men to stop, ej- to kind of stop ejaculating for a while except for when they're waiting, except for when they're trying to get pregnant? You know, I, I don't because what happens with sperm and it's really debatable from a Western doctor's point of view from an Eastern perspective point of view that we want some ejaculation because this it's not bad it's not good to like not ejaculate so it's like they call it cleaning the pipes really like even a man who's giving a sperm sample won't ejaculate from like two to four days before the sperm sample and then he has to ejaculate because they don't want two weeks the sperm like builds up it's not good right so regular right when you're trying to conceive you should be regularly ejaculating that makes sense yeah Yeah. but with i guess i was just thinking with and this would be another show which we probably (laughs) should do about tantric sex and about because men who get older and who aren't trying to conceive to just kind of do the practice of just energy flow in couples and I just love the idea of it also when you are trying to conceive of learning to have more connected sex because if you learn it now you're going to have that for your lifetime together I mean it, yeah I mean it, I, it's so sad I'll have some couples that'll be like okay we have five minutes we have like ten minutes we have five minutes like the woman's not even lubed she's not you know it like takes all that yeah. time right 20 to 45 minutes to lubricate to and war- yeah oh, to get aroused and like they're not in the mood and the guy's like oh I just like it kills me oh, <laughs> well I know I know they, or they're telling you this like we only have five minutes yeah we like, I, I mean I have a woman who's so stressed out right now and she and she and her husband are like they had a miscarriage they had, they, and they're not doing well and that like they're 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 very busy professionals and they don't have a lot of time to have sex all the time. So what, and you can't be like, because I feel like people come to you, you must become like their sex therapist and their acupuncturist and their coach because I feel like what I hear from a lot of couples and I'm sure they come to your office as well, that they're, that they have, they're like, yeah, we're trying to get pregnant but we actually have no, they probably tell you everything, we have no sex drive, I haven't really been into my partner for a while but now I'm trying to have sex. Like what do you, what do you do with that to get their drive back up? Like how do you work with your patients who come to you if they're like, I haven't really been into it lately or I've been stressed or I'm not having orgasms or pleasure? You know, it, it's so complicated, like you call right? Troops. <laughs> like, yeah. like the women's drive is so complicated. Like yes. everybody comes to my office, checks the, I have no sex drive. I would say 99% of women that I work with. And Amazing. And tell me about the age of range of women. I mean, I wake women in like 18, to you know, sixty five, seventy. And I mean, they have I, no sex drive. Ninety nine percent check no sex drive. No sex drive. Jesus, I mean, believe that it's it's crazy. So, but so we we talk about like what is a sex drive. I try to educate them about like what is a arousal versus desire. Right. That yeah. sometimes women, you know, if like a if a, your partner's like, hey, let's have sex, which oftentimes happens. Like women are like, ugh, I'm tired. Like don't ask. Last me. thing on my mind. Right. It's last thing on my mind. But arousal is like, well, if I, you know, like if you if the husband or the partner like you know gets a woman aroused she might be more interested in having sex right it's the arousal that inc- increases desire right, right exactly so it's creating it's giving couples more things to do together like to all day long like texts in the morning you know like all day Send foreplay oh yeah foreplay all day yeah foreplay starts after the last orgasm <laughs> exactly just keep, keep going. it going I mean I think that really works though I mean I feel like you have to especially when you're trying to conceive and you already know this is going to happen and maybe if you you haven't started yet this is great thing to keep in mind to work on start having those conversations about what you guys want to try sexually start exploring start opening it up now so your our guys are already on track you already have a, a, a full sex life or you already have one that you're both interested because in. I think when couples get past all the shame and the trauma and the blaming and all that stuff then sex becomes like their new hobby like it can be a really fun thing for couples who don't get all hung up on he said she said and all their past traumas if you could just kind of Start today. If you're listening to this, go talk, start talking to your partner today about your sex life and what you want to try. And that is what's going to help you have better sex. Absolutely. The communication part. Absolutely. And I, you know, sometimes I do the most basic things with my couples, like, you know, like a hug, like that deep embrace body hug naked, like 
or kissing or lighting some candles, putting on some music, taking a shower together. I mean, these are like basic stuff, but people don't do that they anymore. Don't. They, they do don't. it when they met, then they don't do it anymore. Right. They do it when they met for the first three months, maybe, and then they and then everyone trying to get back to where it was at the beginning. And and it's never going to feel like it exactly like that in the beginning. But if you even just think what worked for you then, try it now. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised at where it takes you. It might be somewhere even better than the beginning, something new and deeper because now you guys have that that connection and you have the years and you have the history. So I have a question though. When people come in, you're saying they have a low sex drive. Now here's the thing. It could be so many things because it could be medications. Absolutely. It could be birth control pills. And I want to ask you, have you seen impacts of birth control pill on women? Because I'm really sort of obsessed with this now. There's a great, do you know jo- Jolene Brighton? She wrote this book called Beyond the Pill and she was on the show a few months ago and there's been a lot coming out now about the pill. So what have you found with that, with women? I, I'm, I'm they're not, going off it. They're like, why can't I get pregnant? Yeah, a lot of times women who are on the pill for a long time, their hypothalamus, pituitary, ovarian access gets like, Slice and they don't get their yeah they don't get their periods back and I have to really work with them to get their periods back but I think it's like an overuse people have been on the pill for twenty years and never went off it I I think I, yeah I'm not it's a great birth control so it's the best birth control right. we have but it's not for everyone so do you tell people so when women are on it they obviously they go off it by the time they're coming to see you they're so working with you as an acupuncturist you can help them kind of get their periods again if they're not or start to yes yes I it's like the acupuncture helps to reconnect the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis right. and get it flowing again and sometimes I'll have to give them herbs or depending on what's going on but I yeah. think it's I don't think it's great to hear that women just aren't getting periods oh yeah the ones who have all the, there's people that take the pill and never yeah. get a period or like the what IUDs about with that? all the yes. stuff in them oh, ooh, Tell, oh can we talk about that for a second yeah I mean I'm not a big fan unless someone has like really bad like there's there's reasons to like people who bleed continuously like that's the Western medicine approach as you put yeah but I think they're bleeding continuously because of underlying issues yes and obviously. I work with those underlying issues so when I get when they finally are to get pregnant then I have to work to regulate their body so you're busy yeah. that's a lot with women <laughs> well no it is because of the underlying issues are things they never dealt with since they were like went on the pill yeah. right so now they're older yeah okay so they didn't go what about like medications though what about um like antidepressants and stuff that are also affecting sex drive like how do you I mean yeah I mean I have I have people on SSRIs and like sometimes the men have a really difficult time ejaculating because they, they and, and the woman will be like it's taking me a really long time it's taking me so long just to just to get them to ejaculate it's so it's pressure for these couples so for it's, in some cases men need to go off them in some cases they don't it really some I think they're giving out a little too much like candy I do too and 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 where people don't really need them they could use other things so I'll have them work with like a, a someone like a naturopath or somebody to help them get off or perhaps me to do some other other ways to deal with anxiety not just SSRIs okay. right and there's blood pressure medication there's a lot of things that impede sex drive and yes. ability to perform well yeah. you must have learned so much over these 25 years too doing it I mean you're also a certified sex coach so you get this stuff but has there been anything though you said lately you've noticed there's a lot of low fertility in men infertility in young men, men. Young, yeah like how young I have like like 35 year olds 40 I mean 25 I just women you know that oh what I'm seeing right Tell now me, is yeah. women I have I have a bunch of patients now in their 20s that are premature ovarian failure meaning they're not getting periods at all they're not even ovulating and their follicle stimulating hormone is really high and nobody knows why so I think there's a lot of like is it auto- food is it everyone I, was saying like it was milk remember or wherever they yeah. ate in child you know or process meat or chicken. Yeah, I, I think everything. I think it's complicated. I think there might be a lot of more autoimmune conditions these days, where the body just sort of shuts down. Maybe some hidden illnesses or pathogens. It's hard to know, but there. So we really don't know. We don't know. Or like it could be unprocessed emotions as well, right? Yes, and people <laughs> who have abuse. You know, the body, like in Chinese medicine, we say the heart is really connected to the hypothalamus pituitary. And when, you know, something happens that's tra- traumatizing, it cuts off this this heart connection to the reproductive organs and maybe you don't ovulate. So trauma is a huge one. It's huge. Where do you send people for trauma work? What kind of work have you seen to be helpful? Um, I, I, I interviewed a bunch of people for Conceiving with Love or Trauma. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, there's things called, um, you know, like there's like, what is it, brain spotting and there's EMDR. EMDR. That's what I've done lately. And and but there's also like um, one of my someone I interviewed for my 
uh, my book, did this thing called havening, which is this sort of self-soothing technique where you're kind of stroking and saying things. It's it's again for trauma and re- sort of programming the the brain, somatic experience. There's mm-hmm. there's even like I interviewed someone for um, yoga that was trauma yoga, you know, where you ask permission, like if you would like to, <laughs> yeah, put your arm out. And I loved that. I love I, that too. We have to teach more about that. Yeah, I think. permission, right? Consent. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break and we come back more with Denise Wiesner. I work a lot with trauma. You do even even in doing your in acupuncture. Yes. Wow. I okay. work with with kind of unleashing in the body because the body holds so much trauma. So I have I have a lot of women with vulvodynia, like pain. Um, they can't even have intercourse. So um, I will work with them to sort of help the body release some of the pain. That's release amazing that. to me. Yeah. So the, with because I know that we've been talking about like pelvic floor physical therapists yeah. can help as well but you can yes. actually do it with acupuncture yeah I mean it's, it takes a team it takes a village right it does so. <laughs> take a village it's not just one thing which is no. I realize just dealing with um just other hormonal systems like do you, so you also work with women who are menopause perimenopausal what have you seen with that helping I think women? I, I just had a woman yesterday that came into that was just not knowing what to do because her doctor wanted to put her on hormones and she didn't know if she wanted to be on hormones and it's that that struggle of like do I want to be on hormones and are they bad for me so because I don't I'm not a doctor I don't prescribe hormones I'll do some natural things and I'll and I'll I really want to make sure the tissues are lubed like I want to make sure a woman doesn't like dry up right and and everybody's individual in that way so I might recommend like rose oil as a as a to plump up the tissues okay as like it's put inside of you is yeah it? yeah rose oil essential oil, heard rose of that. oil. Yeah, yeah did not know that yeah okay what else don't we know about our vagina what could plump us up what else could we use <laughs> anything else um I'll do rose oil and I mean actually you know using it <laughs> right having regular sexual is, is yeah. you know getting blood flow down there I might do have women do like ovarian massage like where they uh, they massage their ovaries mm-hmm. um, do like breathing down there do some kegel exercises pl- like plump up those tissues because right. they, they need to be they used. need to be used absolutely masturbation yeah prescribe masturbation I do and I, I can't believe how many women like don't. still have shame around it Right, so you bring it up to them, they're like, "Oh no, I don't." Or they say, "Oh, I know, I should." What do they say typically when you so ask them? I, if they I just I asked a very young woman that the other day, and she was like, "No, she never did." It was like shamed in her in her in her family. Yeah, we get that every day. I mean, we're trying to oh. trying to undo that. People still carry that around that it's gross, it's wrong. But men, they we expect them to masturbate. It's all yeah. on the outside, but for you know, their penis is outside. Oh. They're masturbating. They're adjusting. They're touching their penises. But for women, we're like, oh no, it's shame, shame. No, but men have shame around it too. Yeah, yeah, I have that's men true. That, that are really shamed about masturbating, and it's yeah. I don't think it's just yeah. women. Yeah, <laughs> the, I guess it's more like culturally, we're cool with it, and. You're right. Men have, are upset about it. I think culturally, we just expect it in a way that men are going to masturbate. Right, right. But but for women, yeah. yeah but I then men have shame too because religion, upbringing, mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. And they still carry it. You don't think you got to check that at the door. So you must, that's what I'm saying, You must. they must sit in there and you're like their therapist as well. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I'm the first person they've ever talked to about abuse that's happened to them. Like they've never talked about it or things they've never How told anyone. How does it anyone. come up? Like do they start feeling emotions around it you asking them in their intake form I might ask their intake form or like you know what they think or it's you know what it is is that I have time I think Western doctors don't have a lot of time to talk to their patients. Everybody's in a rush to get, you know, the yeah. blood test. And so the fact that I'm asking them these questions that they're thinking about and they, they fill out this huge intake form, they have time. There's time. There's space and time. Yeah. And especially if there's if they're trying to get pregnant, there's they they need to explore these things because there's something in the way. I mean, that's amazing. You've helped thousands of people get pregnant. I've been doing this thousands a long time. Couples. I know, but still, what it, it just it must feel amazing. Like when they call you and they're like, "It's happening." You know what? I it is amazing. And then also, there's a part that's um, hard too because sometimes tragedy happens, right? Like a miscarriage, and and sometimes like I had a woman whose baby died yesterday who came into my my clinic, and you know not everything's happy, right? Sometimes it's it's like it's a, a it's it's a lot. It's the human experience. Going back to getting pregnant and, and talk about fertility. What about IVF? Like, what is that process really like? Are you working with couples? You work with them going through IVF? Can we just talk what it's like? like sexually speaking for the couple and then how the process yeah. I don't really yeah, yeah. I actually don't really know much people don't really talk to me much about it. I understand the basics but I love this because 
I, I I work with with couples a lot going through IVF, and because so it becomes that they're you know if they're growing, women are growing follicles and they contain eggs, and their right. their ovaries get really busy, B- big big <laughs> busy. They're busy. They're busy, busy doing, and right. they're big. They're and, busy. Their ovaries are busy. I can't call you back for a month. Okay, yeah, can't have lunch for her. Yeah, and, and they're they're growing them, and so a lot of women feel bloated, and they're shooting themselves up, and they, they feel distended, and they probably are not the most sexual. However, because their estrogen is getting a, a really elevated a lot of women are more sexual and they don't know what to do and I actually included a chapter on timing and I interviewed a bunch of doctors because they don't know when they can have sex so let's say they can have it but they doctors don't really want the sperm right. when they're growing these eggs you know a runaway sperm um, before they ovulate it would not maybe a good, right. be a good thing and uh, so they don't they're sort of like you can have sex up until this point and then there's this idea that when the ovaries get too big they could torque if you have intercourse so I actually yeah, was like I, well what about like clitoral stimulation what about all these other types of sexuality sexuality is just not penis and vagina on exactly. a date right yeah so I wrote a whole ch- I wrote a whole chapter about timing and like when you can have what and and a lot of doctors really don't know like they say after IVF like bed rest like pelvic rest no sex because because they they, they don't want the uterus to contract because they're afraid that it will dislodge this embryo but the truth of the matter is there's no research to say that once an embryo is implanted it's going to discharge right. so it, you know they say all these things but nothing's really there's not a lot of research about it so okay. it, it brings this question of sexuality during IVF sort of it's it's really about asking the doctor but usually it's okay um it's usually okay but maybe not ejaculate in the in the canal okay but yeah like, what about know, clitoral stim- yeah yeah orgasms exactly i mean fine. orgasm should be fine right it should clitoral stimulation should be fine but nobody talks about it there's no detail that just says pelvic rest or no intercourse but women are wondering what women don't want to ask and they're afraid to ask their doctor but they don't know and so they just don't have any sex so which these isn't poor great men. for intimacy yeah <laughs> yeah it's terrible and so you know it, it, and and so I really wanted to bring that topic up and talk about you know to what what you can do that it's okay to you know and there's also different ways to be intimate right it's not like yeah you know, what else, yeah kissing and you know spending time together and cooking together and and really talking and touching and hugging I mean I think touch is so under people don't touch it's like you know what I mean like I I just I'm doing this workshop and I was like oh we're gonna do rose petals like we're gonna do rose petal touch like bringing tools into the bedroom to make it like exciting you know just to to be touched are you doing a you're doing the workshop which this will come out after the show, but when the workshops that you're are you teaching them around the country, or are you? I'm 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 starting I'm I'm starting a, a workshop on Saturday for two hours at Inside LA, right uh-huh. around here, and I'll be doing that with some Tibetan bowl drumming, which will be for fertility, uh, for, for fertility, for sexuality, for intimacy, and fertility, like exercises to help people like breathing exercises, just to get like stimulation back down there. We don't breathe. I always have a breathe into your pelvic floor, but how do you explain breathing to people? Because people don't breathe well. I I had to relearn how. Well, I never learned how to breathe. So I was breathing fight or flight, and I right, still do right. sometimes when I forget to breathe. But how do you explain it? Uh, diaphragmatic breathing. But I actually do this microcosmic orbic practice with people. Microcosmic orbic. orbic is yeah. the best thing I've ever heard. Yeah, I don't even know what it is, but tell it's me. It's basically like taking the energy and like kind of like maybe doing a little bit of like squeezing the. the this is not breathing. This is like breathing for sexuality. Sorry. It's fine. No, right. we so, all. I think. We, I think that everyone listening could benefit from this. Right. It's like it's kind of like you're. Pelvic. You're you're sort of doing a little bit of a kegel and kind of getting the energy in your in your pelvic floor. And sometimes uh, in Taoist practices, they might tell you to sit with like a your heel with a ball pressed into your 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 vagina, like sorry, your clitoris. Yeah. You know, just sort of to stimulate that area, and you sort of get it going. So you stimulate the energy there, and then you take the energy with the breath up the spine, inhaling and exhaling down the front of your body down to the reproductive organs and squeeze them a little bit and you're like really circulating squeeze it yep yeah so breathing I mean abdominal breathing would be like you know inflating the belly as opposed to breathing uh, up in the chest would be relaxation breath but just this breath is is really about circulating energy so it gets people to start focusing on the connection between our whole body not just our genitals like that it's all connected well that's that that and I think that's really key probably to the work you do and the and the work that that I do is that when there is such a disconnect that it's like our genitals are totally separate from us we don't even want to look and then except for when it comes time for sex and then we're like why isn't it pleasing pleasurable or why aren't I ready it's because we're not connected and I, I'm always looking for great examples to give people about breathing it so picturing their pelvic floor I like the thought of squeezing it which is kind of a Taoist mm-hmm. I was with some guy once and we were practicing this I remember 
It was amazing. Having sex, I was like practicing and over, and you do, you start to feel it. Like you'll think it might sound so woo woo, but like when you really visualize this and you're picturing the energy moving down into your pelvic floor and circulating it, it's like you're in it. It's connected. It's just energy. It and then, works. and then couples, like uh, if they if they're facing each other, can practice. This is really cool. It's really hard to describe, but they can practice breathing in. So when you do this practice, then you send the energy to your your partner and then you when you inhale you inhale up your partner's spine and feel and exhale down the front and then you bring you inhale his energy into you so this you're is making what I did, yeah yeah you're making an infinity loop with yes. your energy and you think oh that's like no big deal but it's so powerful it's so powerful if you just do sit there for sit suspend all disbelief about it and then try right. it with your partner to connect again what are some of the some of the stories you hear from couples because i'm sure that you really have brought intimacy back into so many people's lives, not just babies, but also just through the, if they following your protocol, which you have a lot in your book, Conceiving with Love, which I think is a must. I'm already like buying it for three people and sending it to them today. Um, but what you probably, you know, tell me about some of that. You probably rekindle because they come in, they're like stressed. They're like not getting pregnant. You know, yeah. a, a couple, I, I had a couple once where the man had so much shame around, he couldn't ejaculate in his in his partner so they did IVF because he couldn't ejaculate well, he just couldn't get over it he just couldn't release into his partner and it happened anxiety right and, yeah it happened to his his first marriage he couldn't ejaculate in in her and and there was so much shame around it that they got divorced and this was his second partner and she was like that's fine we'll do IVF right it's not a big deal and, but 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 then by saying the permission, he probably started. No, what happened? Did no, he, start, he, oh. he. You know, I think it's like he, no one explained to him like why this could be. Like there was no instruction of like, oh th- yeah, that happens sometimes. Men have a different kind of masturbatory style than maybe their 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 partner's vagina yeah. can give. And so you know all these techniques. But they went to the IV, IVF doctor, and the IVF doctor was like, yeah, just do an IVF. So so he was carrying around this immense shame. And when we sort of released the shame from him, like, you know, sort of like, ah, it could be this. And, you know, maybe you could try it with your hand and or you just then you just ejaculate. Like there's all these other ways you can do it. They had the most fun because they actually freed their sexuality. Right. You know, they ended up doing an IVF and and she got pregnant. But but um, it. It, it free just the the getting over shame is like freeing for for men and yeah, women. Yeah, it really is. Mm-hmm. But I mean, because because the second you release it and you actually are vulnerable and share it with your partner that I'm actually having shame about it. Well, they love you. They're with you. They're trying to have a baby with you. They're trying to build a life with you. You, you it's amazing how the truth around all this could could truly set you free the right. shame and, or just talking about like fantasies right or something that you yes. want to do it's like there's so much shame um i, I remember going to i i went to this like dungeon and i had to like this talk with somebody because I, I was really interested in like bdsm and just like what you know that because i wanted to write about it yeah, my book. yeah yeah <laughs> and then afterwards we went to this this little restaurant and they were all talking and i i talked to this guy and i was like are you know because i saw it had a wedding ring i was like oh does your partner know that you're in to this and he was like oh no like he had this totally separate existence from like you know what I mean he had a partner here and then he was doing this other thing on the side and I thought that's so sad it like it's sad to me why can't we just like sort of be unafraid to say like you know what I really would love this and to, to be able to Find talk about now. like yeah let's like you know dress up like this for me and it could be so simple right. it doesn't have to be major right exactly no I mean this is exactly I feel like life is is, is so short I have a, guy, a friend of mine he's like about to propose to someone and I'm like, well, have you told her about, because I know him really, we've been friends forever, about how you like to, you're into, you know, power play. He's like, oh, no, no, I, I couldn't. And I'm like, but that's such a big part of who you are. And he's like, but I, I don't think she'd be into it. I just feel like it, he's, he's a smart guy. He's got a good life. But what we are so afraid of just the words of just <gasps> saying it, what's going to happen, all this fear. And I'm like, you really want to walk down the aisle and close the door? On them. What if she's into it? And he just couldn't. He couldn't get past it. I'm like, I, I don't think you should marry. You know, I, I, you can't. Like, I'm like, I get so angry, and I and support it in my own. I'm like, I'm angry that we are all walking around with all these big secrets that we're so afraid of sharing. And, yeah. and sometimes you just need permission, and that's you know, I guess what we're doing here. Yeah, but exactly. It's okay to share. It's okay to share. And like, you know, it doesn't have to, you can do it in, you know, baby steps. It doesn't have to be this, you know, like, let's try this or let's explore this or dress up like this. I mean, how much fun can that so be? So fun. Dressing up, you become another person. It's like, to me, we all like, you know, feel like Halloween or just feeling sexy. Whatever makes you feel sexy, get a few costumes, get a wig. This woman once told me, I've mm-hmm. like, that she's like, my best, she was like 80. She's like, the best sex advice is get a wig. Because you like, look like someone, and it makes sense. You 
it feels really good just to not keep walking in the bedroom in the same place doing the same thing. Just like we switch up our workouts. Absolutely. Switch up your goddamn sex life, people. It'll be yeah, fun. Just, or do it in a different place. I mean, sometimes it's like not even the, you know, doing it in the bedroom only. Right. You know? Do it in the living room. Do it wherever. Do it in the kitchen. Get a hotel room for a night. I mean, do you often tell couples, do you prescribe like, vacation get out of town or do a lot of couples also get pregnant out of town I would think that would happen it, it, it's really true it, I, I wish it wasn't true I mean, in a way because it's such a cliche but going away is the best thing ever yeah for people if you're trying like, to get pregnant just book a trip a, a vacation is so needed because couples actually you know have intercourse then yeah <laughs> exactly so fuck vacation one night even outside the room what about once they have the baby and like sex oh. is off the table for a while what happens then when they're like they can't really have sex. Do you see people afterwards, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, what yeah. It's a big then? thing. I was like, like thinking I should write another book. Yeah. Um, it, you know, there's 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 something to be said about like the first few months. Everybody's really tired. Babies aren't sleeping. You know, men are tired too. And I think everybody's sex drive sort of plummets. But after a while, after a certain window where the baby's sleeping a little bit better, I feel like women need help because women are like usually like they're getting so much of their touch needs met. You know what I mean? Because the baby's right. all over them, hanging, breastfeeding. That they're just, the sex drive is... Is, is really lower it for really women. It really is. Yeah, it really is. And so it, it becomes a lot of advice to women it, that I've heard is like, you got to do something with your husband. Like, you got to help your husband because women are, no, it's not as, it's not like it once was, right. but it does come back. Yeah, let's talk about that. So yeah, it does. It does. Yes, I'm here to tell you. <laughs> it does. It does come back. And it maybe, does. And what about hormones being like a little messed up after though? Yeah, I mean, if you're breastfeeding, you have prolactin and that sort of sometimes dries up your vagina. And so that, that kind of gets in the way, right? That's where lube really is important. But um, I think women, yeah, it's, I think it's communication. And I think it's like sort of just getting, I think the biggest thing is tiredness. People are tired when they have kids. Like you've been all day, if you're, if you're home with your kid, you've been all, you know, they're like all over you all day long. And then you want to go to sleep. Like I used to say to my husband, uh, my late husband, sleep was my first lover. Right. Like I just needed to get sleep. Right, like exactly. don't touch me. I got to sleep. I don't I get it. Yeah. But so I think it, I think it does come back and I think it's, it's work and it's about spending time again. It's intimacy, right? It's spending time together. It's, it's cultivating. It's, you must get away. There must be a babysitter. There has to be time away from the baby. You have to, you have to really make that happen. Otherwise to, your kid's going to be fine. Yeah. They, they have it where they, you know, people don't go away for two years. They're it's afraid crazy. to leave. crazy. You got to leave. The, you have to. They're, they're, uh. And relationships suffer. They do. It really does. When you have the intimacy, you still have to prioritize your relationship. Mm hmm. God, it's so true. Question. Is it true that women having an orgasm can increase the chance of conception? The sperm suck up theory is what it's called. It's a theory. So there, it's not been proven 100%, but there is a thinking. So you don't have to have an orgasm to conceive for sure. But there's an idea that when the sperm, when the sperm is near your cervix, that if you have an orgasm afterwards, it'll help the suck up the sperm. Of course, it's a theory and, um, and nothing's proven. So women who don't orgasm, you know, shouldn't feel panicked that they can't get pregnant, right? right? But I had a funny story where I had a same-sex couple that were getting sperm um, next door from, and it's in my book, okay. next door, right. and, and they were like having to do that sort of like the turkey baster method, right? And then they, one would give the other an, an, an orgasm to like get it up, which I thought was so cute, exactly. right? They said they were having the most sex ever. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah. Like a clitoral orgasm, like right? Like right after it goes in there, just yeah, a clitoral use a orgasm. toy or yeah. use something. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that's a theory, but why not? I think no any theory about having an orgasm is going to... I'm just telling you, I don't know what an orgasm doesn't help with. <laughs> when is an orgasm a detriment? I, I would agree. I, I, really? Right. And we can have lots of them. We're really we lucky. We can have so <laughs> many orgasms. I mean, I actually never really want to uh, stop sometimes with my toys and things. Um, so what about like turkey baster? Could you explain that? Um, when you it, said that, like, really, what is it? Well, okay, it so I don't. you really probably wouldn't get a turkey baster, but they no, I know. Don't they, use the literal turkey yeah, baster yeah. for Thanksgiving. They, they do have these little these these um, like they're for intercervical inseminations. If you wanted to do them at home, you would have fresh sperm, and then you put them in this insemination tool, and then you put it up you like you know like when you're ovulating. Yeah, just, yeah, you just sort of suck it in there if you have like fresh sperm. But when when they do I, I inseminations from a doctor's office, they 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 wash the sperm. So you're actually not getting the semen part of it. You're just getting the sperm part of it and then they actually put it up you with a with a specific tool. That's that's an uh, an, an IUI, inner uterine insemination, different than an uh, inner cervical insemination okay. that you can do at home. That's kind of like the turkey baster. Okay, got it. Um then what about lubes? 
Oh, yeah. Because yes. you lose when you, have a, when you want to have a baby. People yeah. ask me it all the time. Yeah. I mean, I, I really want to make sure that women who are ovulating have really good cervical mucus when they're ovulating. It should be that, like. How do they know? You know, Let's describe it. I know you talked yeah, about it. It's, it's, it's egg white. It's like raw egg whites. And if you put it between your fingers, it stretches. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's not sticky and, you know, tacky. I mean, it's amazing how many women don't know what their cervical mucus means. No. It's, it's amazing. So, but anyway, it's this, it's, it, it happens before you ovulate. And the sperm can live in this mucus because. Because it's more alkaline. It makes the vagina a little bit more alkaline, right? The vagina is mostly acidic. So it makes it alkaline. The sperm can live in it. And so when women start to get the cervical mucus, it's a great time to begin intercourse. So some women, if they've had like injuries, like they've had, you know, sort of cervical, some of their cervix removed, may not make as much cervical mucus. In that case, a lube might be really good. And you want to use an, a lube that's, um, there, there is FDA approved lubes to use specifically for that window when the, when the sperm becomes more alkaline okay yeah so like but you know and, and some doctors say like things like coconut oil it's there's a lot of you know there's not a lot of research so it gets to be like there you isn't re- a lot of research yeah. on getting uh, all the stuff for women yeah there's so it, you know sort of like some people say coconut oil is okay some people are like no that's not good it, it's confusing um i've it had it's confusing yeah i had a urologist say that vegetable oils were okay but no yeah i can't it, imagine that yeah but I, I i think um it's important if a woman's not making her cervical mucus to make sure that you know really she's it's, there's enough foreplay that she's aroused because women should get wet. Did we get into your foreplay chapter or did we skip it? Didn't we talk about earlier we were going to get into foreplay? It's 20 to 45 minutes. That's the most yes. important thing. 25 Just minutes of arousing it. women. It's good <laughs> it, it's Women are shocked when I tell them this. It's amazing because that never happens. Never it's usual, ever happens. Whoa. And then we wonder why we don't want to have sex. We have a low sex drive. Yes. We need it. We, we need it. I always say... Well, that's my side. Never. I usually have one that said foreplay is not just a suggestion; it's a requirement. We're not just like, "Oh, it'd be nice." Like we require it, yeah, for pleasure, for orgasm, for yes. conceiving. Yes. Do you give women also like beginning like um, masturbation tips? It's like you have the art of self pleasuring, but I don't know. What are some things like, if they're feeling weird about it, or and men too? Like they. I have for self pleasuring. I do. I do like I do a breast massage thing because women should like touch their breasts. It's yes. very arousing to touch your breasts. I know. Let's talk, let's, can Good. we talk, explain that to our? Yeah, our I mean, I'll have women t- do like get some you know oil and start massaging like special aromatherapy and start massaging their breasts because it's really good for their breasts to massage right. them, right? And also, you know, why is it good for their breasts? Because it it, it stimulates the tissue. I mean, it's 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 tissue in our breasts, right. like any tissue. It's like we want to. We know, don't think to touch them sometimes, and also in relationships, sometimes you find like your partner's. Really into your breasts and they forget about them and then nothing happens and no yeah, one they forget them. they forget about I them. I thought like, you liked my breasts. And what happens to my breasts? Right over. Yeah, exactly. But the stimulation's really good. It's also very arousing, right? So and and so I think I had a Tantra teacher once that said like for men sexuality is, is their penis, but for women starting out it's their breasts. Yes. So yeah. So foreplay for women for sure breasts, but massaging um, breast massage is super good with oils for women just to do on their own. Yeah. And then it's it's arousing and then hopefully it's getting some kind of juices flowing exactly. and then they can do a little bit of, of touch and exploration around, you know, how does their clitoris like to be touched? Does it like to be, you know, I had a woman yesterday that was like, I don't like my clitoris touched. I don't like oral sex. And and I was like, oh, that's so interesting. And I was like, well, I wonder, you know, what her anatomy is like. Like maybe her clitoris is way too sensitive and her partner is like touching it too aggressively. Right, and that's exactly. like maybe needs to go around the hood a little bit right. and not go directly on the clitoris. Or just on the labia or on the pubic yeah, nail, just, go into it. Or yeah. maybe if she's really aroused, it'll be less so. Exactly. Right. But I don't think she knows that. So like she's got to have to. So one of my things for her is to like find out by yourself. Exactly. Yeah, and I don't think she ever masturbated before. Yeah. So, Gosh, wait a minute, we got to get on the masturbation train. And I love what you're saying about what kind of essential oils do you, should we rub into our breasts? Um, you know what? I, I want to go do that now. Yeah, I actually had a thing. There's there's a lot of one that I have in my book, and I don't know that one by my heart. But okay. um, but there's I think there's like some frankincense, and then there's like I mean there's lots of stimulating oils for yeah, aphrodisiac, good. like rose oil, um, sandalwood is good, um, geranium, rose geranium, the, yeah, like I've the read about Leon Leong. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good all, one, too. Yeah. And I, I just love what you're saying about the breasts, because I think for a lot of women who feel like they, they try to masturbate or they don't want to, I think just starting with your breasts could also be just a great gateway and less threatening, maybe. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, okay, so I'm not going to make you orgasm it, but just for tonight, just massage your breasts and then see if it gets you in the mood for... For masturbation. It's such a good way of describing it. Like I just like to ma- that. Yeah, I like it too. Thank yeah. you. Well, you said it. Now I'm taking it out. I'm taking <laughs> I it like in. It. It's amazing. Um, what about sexy foods? 
Uh, People were saying, is aphrodisiacs a real thing, Emily? Do I really, what about oh, it? Well, well, there's aphrodisiacs like herbal medicine, which I do a lot of in my practice. Uh, okay. Like just really to help like hormones and they're, they're really good. I mean, the horny goat weed is one of them, right? Yeah. The horny goat weed, right? I think they gave it to goats in the fields and noticed they were having more yeah, sex. Yeah, it's work. It's real. But sexy foods, I, I yes. I mean, like chocolate. Dark chocolate, right? It's Best. it's got so many. It's like a it's got so many good things for you, and it's great. I mean, not too much, but it is. And I, I mean, I talked about some in my like the goji berries, but um, pumpkin seeds or you know even oysters. I mean, it's cliche, but they actually are. They contain zinc, and zinc is great for erections and for women for fertility. So it, it's it's they are sexy. Let's have a sexy dinner and make some yeah chocolate. asparagus. Asparagus. Well, I think that's that's the old wives' tale and asparagus. I I, I put it in because uh, someone I a book I read uh, was talking about like how they used to think it was sexy. Uh, garlic, and, right? Gar- pineapple. Well, garlic increases you know it increases blood flow, right? Because garlic it, it opens up the blood vessels, and that's what we want for you know not only for our, an erection but for our clitoris. I think that's really important. So you tell couples you send them home with like. Recipes like add garlic. Um, you know what? I, I usually do a fertile. I should, probably we should do like a sexy food for pregnancy book. You should, right? Yeah. Should, There's a lot of spinoffs. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah. I, I like that idea. Yeah, uh, but but I'll, I'll I'll do a fertility friendly and have them do fertility friendly foods, which are really good for you. I mean, you know, garlic is like you know I say it, it I say it in my book because it increases blood flow, but like I know I think. It doesn't always go agree with the with the breath. I know. Right? I don't love garlic. But yeah, like, I don't either. No, I try, I try to avoid it. <laughs> and onions. No, same. Yeah, I don't like onions and garlic. No, yeah. same. Yeah. Oh my god. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Denise, for this. I love it. Your book is Conceiving with Love: A Whole Body Approach to Creating Intimacy, Reigniting Passion, and Increasing Fertility. And I really think that there's just a lot of inspiration here about truly reconnecting, reigniting passion, all of that. Um, great tips. Oh. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you and for having me. Buy your book. People can find you at deniseweisner.com. Yes. W i e s n e r. And then where else would you like to send them? Um, my Instagram is Denise Wiesner LAC. And I think that's my Facebook as well. And yeah. then if you want my clinic, there's naturalhealingacupuncture.com. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. And I have five questions that I ask my guests. Yes. Here you go. Ready? Yes. All right. Biggest turn on? Oh, my biggest turn on is like looking my partner in the eyes and light touch. Really. Oh, I like the eye contact. Yeah. Biggest turn off? Honey, do you want to have sex tonight? <laughs> exactly. I think we can all relate to that. Um, how would you describe your sex life or your relationship life in three words? You can pick. Heart, mind, love. Something you would tell your younger self about sex. Have fun. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> Experiment. Yes. Number one sex tip. Be a sexual adventurer. Okay. Thank you so much, Denise, Thank for you being so here. much. Thank you. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed the show. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. We love when you review it wherever you listen. And thanks for sharing this with a friend. And thanks to my amazing team, Ken, Kristen, Michelle, producer, Jamie, and Michael. Was it good for you? Email me, feedback at sexwithemily.com.